<laughs> thank you. And thanks again to the folks at Plaza for having us back. We always appreciate it when you make time for us to come on. And thanks everybody for joining us too. My name is Mary Tevlin. I'm a product expert for gambling. Uh, most of my day I spend talking to other oil painters and artists, helping them craft and choose the right materials for the intention of their work. One thing we're hoping for today's demonstration is that you get at least one useful tip or inspirational piece of information. That's our goal always is that you walk away from this having learned at least one, hopefully several new things that you didn't know before. Uh, this must have set as well. We're going to be going over the contents of this set as well as a full range of the entire Gamblin product line, our colors, our ground. So um, you will learn about what is in your set, but you're also going to get to learn a little bit more about a lot of our other products too. So I'm, I'm really excited for what we're going to cover today. Um, before we start, though, we want to go over a little bit about the history of oil painting, why it matters, and just why painting is more important today than it's ever been before. Um, as many of you already know, painting is just rewarding. It is one of the main mediums that has such a strong power of communication, if you look at the image we've pulled up, those are cave paintings and all the way it back to the history beginning of all, all the way back, you, you have that power of communication with a hand saying, I am here, I mattered. And really painting just has such an ability to tell stories, to communicate ideas, to express our goals, our wishes. So there's never really been a better time to be an oil painter. Um, other cave paintings, you see Lascaux. The storytelling goes back tens of tens of thousands of years back. Um, some of those cave paintings are my favorite to look at. Um, a great documentary is The Cave of Forgotten Dreams from Warner Herzog. Highly recommend that if you want to see more information about those um, amazing discoveries, humanity's cultural heritage, and why, like, moving it today, we want to keep painting alive as much as possible. Um, it's, it's amazing how modern painters in today's age have the most access to color space. And you can see that in modern paintings where gambling colors are used. They're not just from the past, but they're brought forward into the present. And one of Gamblin's main missions has always been to move painting forward and to continue making it relevant and to continue encouraging oil painters to work in oils and, and why that can be so useful. When you wanna convey a message or you wanna convey a feeling, oil paint is one of the best mediums for it. And painters today have some of the best access to those materials. Yet you wanna take a look at what exactly oil paint comes from what is oil paint made and it's one of the most natural like most authentically natural types of of colors that you can get are oil paints it comes from flaxseed the linseed oil um it's a really humble crop it's amazing how it's uh, has such a rich, rich history, the flaxseed, our, our flaxseed actually that we use for our refined linseed oil uh, is, is sourced locally here in North America. And it just has such a wide use to it. People use flax in vitamins, oils, but it's also the, the linen that we paint on. It is the binder in the paints that we use. Uh, if you've never seen flower and flax, it is beautiful. And it's, it's sort of amazing how it can be seen in all steps of the paint. Um, the paint itself is just the, the heart of the story there. You also wanna look at 
the way that paint has been used over time, because that can really craft your palette. If you look at the history and how there are really three main eras of painting that we can consider, um, we're looking here at the Mona Lisa and um, it, you can see the, the difference in the color, the, the way that colors, the old masters had a much more limited access to color space. Whereas when you go further in history, it gets more and more uh, robust in, in choices. So the classical period, really not a whole lot of, uh, there's no good blues, there's no bright reds, you have a kind of decent yellow. And the way that the, the old masters like Da Vinci, Rembrandt, the way that they used their colors, they really had to um, use an indirect style of painting that captured light, that captured contrast. And they couldn't rely on the chroma of the color. They needed to work indirectly in multiple layers of glazes. And, and that was how the classical period was really uh, um, formed was how could painters convey their message with such a limited access to color. And it's it's beautiful. Some people think that the old master's work is intentionally duller or less vibrant, but really that was just due to the uh, more limited access to pigments that they had available at the time. Uh, moving forward into the Industrial Revolution, you have Impressionists. Uh, the Impressionist movement was when a lot of big game changes happened. Probably the most noteworthy is the Industrial Revolution. Uh, people started putting all sorts of different metals and minerals and uh, putting them into furnaces just to see what was going to happen. Furnaces over 4,000 degrees. And from those furnaces, you, that's where you start to get a lot of your impressionist colors, your cobalts, your cadmiums. What really set those apart, um, besides their intensity of color, is they had that opacity to them, the, their coverage and their luminosity. And a lot of people associate that with Van Gogh, Monet, where you just the color just just became so much more vibrant. A big advance in technology then too, outside of just pigments, was the invention of the tube. Before uh, old masters, they would have to grind and mix their colors by hand. Or if you were a big shot, you, you had your assistant mix your colors for you. But it was a really laborious act. And you would usually just make as much paint as you could that you were going to be using that day or for a particular painting. When the tube came now now this was the game changer because now not only did painters have more vibrant more intense colors they had the ability to go in the fields they had the ability to take their paint with them and paint on location taking in the beauty of the landscape and then translating that to their canvas and that was one of those moments in art history i think was was one of the most crucial in terms of that message being brought about. It wasn't so much about the accuracy of the figure. It became more about the color of the figure and the feeling of that landscape. Now we move into the modern era. The modern era of painting is where we are today. And even the impressionists, I think, would be really jealous of the access that modern painters today have. What's interesting about modern colors is how they are often carbon-based as opposed to mineral, and their um, their intensity and is is just completely different from the mineral colors of the impressionists, and we'll show that here soon. But one of the things you always want to remember when you're deciding and, and choosing or crafting your own palette is how do these paints react? Um, do they uh, give me the ability to tell my story, to craft my message? And that's what we're going to lay out here is what colors can do for you. Now, we're going to start 
with a example between two reds and we're working with a cadmium red medium and naphthol red. Cadmium red is a mineral color. Meanwhile, naphthol red is a modern organic. Now, when you have these two paints, it, even now they look identical. Like you would have a really hard time telling these apart. And I'm gonna squeeze them out side by side here so you can see. On the left, we have our cadmium. And then here on the right, we have our naphthol red. And yeah, if if you were just taking a glancing look here, these would not look different at all. They would um, be almost exactly the same, but where they're going to change is when we start mixing them with other colors. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use a neutral Portland gray here. This one doesn't have a color bias to it, so we can more clearly see what's happening. And I'm gonna squirt a little bit out on each end. So when we add cadmium red to this paint, we end up with something that is very muted. It's got not a whole lot of intensity to the color, as you can see. But if you were, by chance, making a naturalistic landscape, maybe a sunset, you really wanted to capture that glow, but have it be very muted and very peaceful, you'd probably rather use a uh, mineral cadmium red for your choice. However, naphthol, on the other hand, is going to have a lot more intensity to it. And you can already notice how it has a brightness to it that leans more pink. It is just going to have more intensity and be a significantly lighter, more intense mixture. And we can show this uh, as well if we grab... Um, we're going to grab next radiant turquoise and show this exact same demo here. If any of you aren't already familiar with our radiants, I'm going to be using them uh, several times in this demo. They are our pastel line and they are gorgeous. These are some of my favorite colors. Uh, they're essentially uh, mostly um, your, your modern organic colors that have been tinted with white. So they have an intense chroma to them. Once again, we're gonna grab a little bit of that cadmium. And as you can see there, we have a mixture that is fairly muted. A nice cool gray. However, when we go over to the naphthol, we're going to see some dramatically different results here. We're there, we're getting a beautiful violet periwinkle. So as you can see from this, two reds, almost identical straight from the tube, but due to their difference in their intensity and how they change other colors, you can have widely different results with what color you mix them into. Um, if I were wanting to do something with a lot of vibrancy, a lot of intensity of color, I would probably stick with naphthol or quinacridone's another great example of a modern organic color. Your secondary and tertiary color mixtures are going to be more vibrant, more intense. So for your purples, your greens, if you want that access to color space to be brighter, you're going to want those. However, if you want a more naturalistic, a more, in a way, romantic palette, the um, mineral colors are always there. And they have their own qualities, too. I'd say their opacity is is 
excellent. And the mineral modern organic colors tend to be more transparent, great for glazing, whereas the mineral colors would be better for more opaque, uh, class, the more classical direct approach. That was our first color mixing demo. I'm going to do another one here. This time we're going to be comparing some beautiful greens for you and how your choice between those colors can really impact your uh, greens mix mixtures. So again, we're going to start with the uh, mineral based. What we have here for this, we have cadmium yellow medium and viridian. Viridian is such a beautiful color. It has, uh, it's almost like a jade quality to it that I really enjoy. Um, hi, Mary. We okay. do have a question about the naphthol red. Um, oh, yeah. Tammy's asking, is naphthol red transparent? Yes, it is a semi-transparent color, technically. It has good transparency to it for glazing, um, whereas with cadmium, you, you'd be fighting against cadmium if you tried to use it for a glaze. Um, naphthol red, and it's not here with me, but it has a sister color, naphthol scarlet, that is also a really nice transparent glazing color. Uh, the scarlet has a little bit more of an orange war warmth to it. Think of it like a modern vermilion. And then naphthol red is more of a primary red. Both are good for glazing. And if you look on the tubes themselves, we have a transparency key on all of the Gamblin labels, which is really nice. You can quickly see that uh, cadmium is opaque, naphthol is not. But another fun feature of our labels, and we just rolled these out about a year ago, um, they have QR links on them. Each individual tube has a unique QR code that will take you to the Gamblin website, and you can learn so much more information about your paint. So any of, you, any of you out there that are getting these tubes, don't miss out on the QR link because you can get some more fun info there, including the transparency and everything else you might need to know about that color right there in the aisle before you buy it or in your studio. You don't have to pull up your iPad to look at stuff and Google. It's just right there at your fingertips. Uh, Back to the colors. So here we have cadmium, yellow, and viridian. Over here, I'm going to be showing Hansa yellow, which just is electric looking, and phthalo green. Fair warning to you out there. If you are not familiar with phthalo green, you need barely any of it. Uh, always <laughs> with phthalos in particular, uh, be it blue or green or turquoise, uh, remember that that phthalo will overpower your palette because it has such intensity to it. So here, our mineral mixture, we're getting a really nice green there. I'd say if I were doing a spring landscape, that'd be perfect. Early March, plein air painting for Easter or maybe a picnic. Yeah, that would work great. However, it doesn't pack a whole lot of punch. And next, we're going to see just how crazy of a difference it is when you switch to the modern organic. It's just like worlds apart from one another, these two colors, like an electric green. And sometimes you need that. Like if you're wanting something that is more of an artificial green, like the outside of a Sprite can, or um, instead of a, a normal landscape, you're going for AstroTurf, th this would be the green for you. So you can really see the difference here in this demonstration, how they're just worlds apart when you go from your, you know, the mineral base to modern organics, you just get an entirely different palette depending on which side of those you're choosing. 
At the Gamblin website, we do have a uh, great amount of resources there. Um, in particular, I would highly recommend our experience color page of the Gamblin website. We have a really good article on the differences of modern versus uh, mineral colors. And you can see a couple more examples there. We also have some great resources there on choosing white, choosing black, um, everything you might need to help you make an informed decision and craft your palette. So when any of you have the chance, check out the experience color section of gamblingcolors.com. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, Mary, uh, Jean has a question. Which pigments survive longer, mineral or carbon? Oh, um, in terms of, that's a great question, Jean. In terms of surviving, I'm going to guess you mean their ability to withstand fading. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's something all artists, you know, would, you know, hate to see happen is to see their beautiful paintings fade with time. And that is a really valid concern since the sun has incredibly destructive power on everything. And one of the things that Gamblin does when we're sourcing pigments and we're crafting paint is we only choose pigments that have really high light fast ratings. Light fastness is a term that uh, is a, it's a measure or a marker of if a pigment is susceptible to fading with time. And one of the amazing things is that all of the pigments are light fast. Uh, to directly answer that question, um, all the way back from the classical, the uh, old masters palettes, your burnt umber, yellow ochre, India red, um, asphaltum, to the modern, uh, the, the impressionist colors, the cadmiums, cobalts, viridians, and then into the modern day, your quinacridones, thalos, naphthols, all of these colors are highly light fast. Every single one of them, with the exception of alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is one of the few, one of the only colors that we carry that does have the potential to fade with time. Um, you can see that information again on the physical tubes or at our website, but um, to address that question, there, there, one is not superior to the other in terms of its permanence and its light fastness quality. They are equal. So even if you prefer mineral colors of the impressionists or the old masters, or if you prefer the modern organic colors, you can, you can rest assured and not lose sleep at night that, that they're all permanent and they're not going to fade. I hope that answered that question. Thank you. Yeah, Jean, you can always expand and we can follow up if you still have questions on that. Thank you. Great. I'm going to be moving on next to uh, the contents of our set and a few other gambling products. But before I move on, I want to make sure if anyone else didn't have any color related questions that we can answer. Because color is a fun subject. I don't want to move on right away unless someone out there has one. No, we're good. Okay, great. All right. So we have this, this must have set that we've crafted. It has everything that you're going to need from the start to the finish in your whole process in terms of the mediums, the solvent, the varnish, plus more. We, we crafted this really with the intention of giving artists a little bit of something to help them along the way. And probably the one, when you're new to oil painting, one of the most um, intimidating aspects is mediums. Mediums in particular can be very, very um, intimidating. And our goal at Gamblin is to eliminate that and to make it easy and simple. I always mention to people that you technically do not need to use medium. There is a, a misconception sometimes that you have to be using medium 
but that isn't always necessarily the case. Many artists prefer working with their paint straight from the tube with no modification. And if you are in that camp, that's just great. We actually formulate the paint to have a consistency that is buttery and smooth so that you can still manipulate it well under a palette knife or with your brush. However, mediums are there to take things further and to help you change your paint, modify the paint if you so choose to. Uh, one of the best mediums we offer is our Galkid Light. We're gonna go over the fluids first. And Galkid Light is one of our most popular mediums. I think mainly for the fact that it really helps speed up the dry time of paint. Uh, if you want your colors to be dry to the touch within a 36 to 48 hour period of time, Galkid Light is there to really speed along and take your painting further. It's a very low viscosity varnish, a uh, medium, not a varnish. And what I'm going to choose to show off this color, actually, I'm going to choose phthalo green, which has a lot of transparency to it. Galkid light is a really popular color, not just for fluid techniques, but for glazing as well. And you can see how dark that phthalo green is. And once we start mixing it into the Galkid light, you just get this vibrant transparency. The Galkid Light isn't the only thing in your set. The other one we've included is traditional linseed oil. And I always tell people that linseed oil has such a great history to it. It's a really well-rounded choice. If you're just looking for something to help thin your paint, not necessarily speed along the dry time process, but to give your paint more flow, more fluid, uh, linseed oil is another great option and it's in your, your kit. If you're using linseed oil, I would say you need very little. You can be a bit more liberal with your Galkid light in terms of how much you add to your paint, but linseed oil is much richer, it's it's much more fatty. So when we're adding that to paint, we're gonna add a bit less of it. If you overload your paint with too much of linseed oil, you can actually end up with some really slow dry time results. So a word of caution out there for you. If you want things to dry a lot faster, I would choose Galkid Light. If you wanted things to dry at, you know, a decent pace, maybe give you at least several days to blend and work wet into wet with your paints, linseed oil would also be a good choice there. Linseed oil is a little bit thicker, as you can probably tell on the camera there, too. It has a more viscous quality because it's more oily. Meanwhile, Galkid Light has a bit more flow to it. And the way that they drip down is different. One other fluid I'm going to show you guys that is not included in your set, but is worth checking out is our solvent-free fluid. Solvent-free fluid lives somewhere in the in between linseed oil and Galkid Light and it's dry time. Um, it won't slow things down significantly, but it won't speed things up nearly as quickly as the Galkid will. One thing I really like about the solvent-free fluid is it's a safflower oil based and it has a really pleasant smell to it, I find. Same with uh, linseed oil as well, which does make a noteworthy thing I must mention is that the Galkid Light does contain Gamsol in it, our odorless mineral spirit. We're gonna be talking about Gamsol in a lot more detail soon because I'm sure some of you have questions out there about Gamsol. And 
Uh, one thing you got to remember whenever you're incorporating Gamsol or a painting medium that has Gamsol in it is you do need to have some ventilation in your studio. And that doesn't need to be a robust uh, exhaust fan. It can be as simple as cracking a window and having a fan going. But you do want to make sure when you are working with solvents like Gamsol that you have some airflow and you have a little bit of ventilation in your space. It's a common misconception within oil painting that the paints, the art themselves, have fumes when that is actually incorrect. It's the uh, solvents that we choose that determine if you need to ventilate your studio or not. And um, not everyone likes to work with solvents. And in fact, there's a growing number of solvent-free painters. And sometimes that's preferred if you work in a small space that you can't properly ventilate, if you have small children in your space, um, that might be why you would opt for a solvent-free option and why we have developed several of those so that you can choose and determine which one's right for your space. So we've covered fluids and the linseed oil and the galcid light that are in your kit. Next up, we are going to talk about, uh, we're gonna be talking about the gels that are in there. And what comes in your must have kit is solvent free gel. Similar to solvent free fluid, this is a non-toxic gel. It does not contain any Gamsol. It does not require any medium, uh, any, any ventilation. What I really like about solvent-free gel is how it gives paint a really buttery consistency. And what you're going to notice here too is how the solvent-free gel itself is very similar to the consistency of paint itself. If you ever get a stiffer color like burnt umber, is one of those and you want to give the paint more flow but you don't want it to become soupy and fluid like with those fluids i just showed you this one is a great option all you need is a little little dab of it mixed in with your paint and you immediately start to get a more buttery consistency it does help with dry time, and I like to emphasize how solvent-free gel provides a really bright, glossy finish to your paint. If you're the type of painter where you like your paintings to just look really juicy and really wet when they're dry, solvent-free gel, adding a little bit of that to all of your colors is going to get you just a very consistent, bright, glossy finish. And the solvent-free gel is what's in your kit. But I would like to show you the other two options that are not in your kit. Those are Galkid gel and Galkid light gel, formerly known as Neo McGilp. For anyone out there that was already familiar with Neo McGilp, just this last year, we changed uh, the name to Galkid light gel for to, to get it in line with our other galkid mediums and to um, have it seem more in the family of gambling products. Uh, galkid gel, if you want a gel that is thicker and dries faster, this is the gel for you. And I'm going to put it here below the solvent-free gel. It has a, um, a, a texture to it that is just really crisp for if, if you like to have sharp marks from your brushes, maintain the texture and the body of the paint, or if you just like painting thickly, but you don't want to wait months for your painting to dry, Galka Gel is going to save the day. And usually if, if you're adding some of it to your paint, even if you're painting relatively thickly, your paintings are going to be dry within a week or less. 
Whereas if you were just using paint straight from the tube, it would stay wet for potentially months, actually. Now the last one I'm gonna show you, Galkid Light Gel, formerly known as Neo McGilp. This one lives in an interesting middle space where it's not as thick as the Galkid or the solvent-free option. It has a little bit of a softer consistency to it. More of a silky consistency is the other word I would use to describe it. and. And it's dry time rate, it's going to stay workable for usually a three to four period, three to four day period of time. One thing I like about it for that reason is if you are working wet into wet and you would prefer to have more time to blend and mix and um, not have your painting, your pack up and get sticky so quickly. If you're a slower painter, this this gel is great for you. It's also a great glazing color too. As you can see here, it is a lot softer compared to the other gels. Um, Mary, I have a question that I might need to ask them for more clarification, but Ong is asking, I believe Galkid is fast drying medium, but I don't understand about Galkid's slow drying medium. Fast oh, drying you might be thinking together. of... Uh, Galkid slow dry is um, a, a Galkid that we we discontinued that about four years ago. If you are wow. referring to the product Galkid slow dry, although fear not, we can talk about it because because it's actually very very easy to recreate the Galkid slow dry. What Galkid slow dry was was essentially Galkid light with a little bit of linseed oil to it. So for some people, they really like the Galkid light, but it would just tack up too quick, especially if you live in a really warm, dry climate, like in the desert, um, compared to an area like Portland here where we have humidity, Galkid light can dry too fast for some painters. And if you wanna modify it, all you would need to do is add in a small amount of either linseed or safflower oil. And even as little as 10, 15% or less added into the Galkid light, you get more of an open time with your paint where it doesn't tack up so quick. You can still expect your paint layers to be dry to the touch within you know, several days but it won't be get while you're working and while you're in the flow of your painting, it won't start tacking up really quickly. And, and I think that is what, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, they're referring to was the, the Galkid slow dry is essentially Galkid light that was modified with a slower drying oil, which does uh, bear mention how all of these mediums we're showing are compatible with one another. You can actually mix and match and, customize your mediums to exactly how you need them to be. In the case of Galkid Light, you can add linseed oil to slow its dry time. You can add Gamsol to lower the viscosity and to make it a thinner fluid. Um, you can also use cold wax, which we're gonna get to in a little bit. We're gonna talk about cold wax, but all of these products are compatible. They can all be intermixed. So even if you're using one at one stage in your painting, you can switch to another at a different stage. So um, no matter what, they're all compatible with each other. That was a very good question on the Galkid Slow Dry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, to conclude on the gels, there we have our three. We have solvent-free gel here at the top. We have Galkid gel in the middle. And then we have Galkid light gel down here at the bottom. And they're all excellent choices. If you like body, you like texture in your paint. If being solvent-free is uh, an important thing for you, I would stick with solvent-free gel as it doesn't require ventilation. 
both Galkid and Galkid Light gel needs some ventilation. The Galkid gel is the fastest option if that is your priority. Whereas um, Galkid Light gel is a little bit longer, more silky, more blending. So they're all excellent choices and the choice between them might usually depend on personal preference or what you like for your painting process. There is a really interesting story behind the Galkid Light Gel in particular, um, formerly called Neo McGilp. And before that, that type of medium was called Marge. And many artists used Marge for years. It's a natural resin painting medium. And we pulled up a slide here to show you guys the differences in color between these two. If you look at the older Marge, it is so dark. It has such yellowing potential that it could impart to your artwork. And when Robert Gamblin founded Gam the company Gamblin in 1980, one of his first missions was to, you know, find materials that were true to the historic working properties of oil painting, but ones that were safer and more permanent. So that meant finding oils, resins, and solvents that were archival. And one of my favorite examples is that photo of the Galkid Light gel, formerly called Neo McGilp, and how in the modern day, it is just so clear. And it is uh, one of those uh, types of things you have to think about when you're selecting your materials especially if you use a lot of white in your work, you don't want that to yellow with age. You can see the influence. Uh, Turner is one of the best examples. If you go to any museum to see a Turner painting, they all have a very amber, very yellowed glow to them. And some people think that was intentional when in fact it was due to the material use and over time, those resins, as they age, yellowing and discoloring the, the artwork. So with the Gamblin line, one of the best things you can rest assured about is how they have significantly less yellowing potential. And you're not going to have that situation where your paintings become um, uh, like tinged with a yellow amber cast to them with age. Uh, we do have a question from Carolyn, um, still about the gal kids. So, um, she's asking, what is in these gels that makes them work besides the gal kid? Oh, so they're, they're ingredients. That's a very good question. So all of these mediums have very simple ingredients. We use alkid resin. That's where the name gal kid comes from. It's an alkid resin medium. It's made from soybean oil. It's, it's uh, just like linseed, flaxseed, safflower. It's another type of fat oil. Alkid is, is derived from soybean. And it, what why it's so popular and why it's been widely adopted as a contemporary oil painting material is mostly because it forms a very strong paint film that's resistant to cracking. It also has really good compatibility with other types of oils. How we make them, in the case of, like, let's use solvent-free gel as an example. This is a mixture of alkyd resin with safflower oil. Meanwhile, in the case of galkid, both the gel and the fluid, it's a mixture of alkyd resin with gamsol. The way the gels are made into their gel structure is with a fumed silica to give them their body and richness and so they're not a fluid like the other products are. Um, so really simple ingredients. Um, and that is what also helps make them compatible with one another and allows you to modify them and mix and match them. I hope that was helpful for Caroline. So moving on, unless there weren't any other questions about mediums from anyone in the audience, we're going to move along to the next item in our kit. But I wanted, in case anyone did have an opportunity, wanted an opportunity to ask another question, I wanted to give them that. These colors are just so bright. 
Um, we do have a general question about the mediums from Jean. Um, they're asking, please explain about humidity and the mediums. Humidity. Well, humidity will um, affect your dry time rate. If you are in a humid climate, especially if that is paired with colder temperatures, that slows down oxidation of your paint. Um, oxidation really is, is encouraged by heat, airflow, and dry conditions. Um, some painters actually, when they have a palette that they like, if you put it in your freezer or your, fr your refrigerator, it will stop the paint from drying out completely. Um, so folks who are in drier climates like the deserts or anywhere where you're at a higher elevation and you have really dry, really warm conditions with little humidity, those are conditions where your oil paints, your oil-based mediums will oxidize at a much faster rate. Meanwhile, if you live in a colder climate with wetter conditions, more humidity, your paintings are going to take longer to dry by comparison to that painter in an arid climate. Great. Awesome. awesome. We do have another one, if you don't mind. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> uh, Michael is asking, could you talk about working fat over lean with these materials? That could be its own hour long demonstration, but I will be happy to condense it really quickly. Um, when you think about fat over lean, what you want is a painting that remains flexible with time, a multi layered painting. For those of you out there that paint all a prima or usually with one layer, you do not need to worry about fat over lean. Fat over lean is only important if you're the type of painter doing a more classical approach where you do many layers at once um, over, over time layering to build up a surface. When we say lean, we're talking about a material like Gamsol, which is in your kit, Gamsol. When we're talking about fat, we're talking about something like linseed oil. So in your earlier stages of your painting, you ideally will be using, uh, if you're working indirect in a classical style with many layers, your earlier stages of your painting will have more solvent or gamsol as your lean fluid, the, the lower the oil content in the earlier stages. And then as you build up on your painting, you would increase that fat content using more of your linseed or galkid light as another example of a fat medium. Now, why is this important? The main reason why it's important is that when you're building up a surface from lean to fat, you're building up your flexibility of your paint film as, as you progress in the painting progress. And you want to make sure that as you're going upward in your layers, that they're becoming more flexible. And that is what fat mediums do. They increase the flexibility of your paint. If you are putting inflexible layers on top of more flexible layers, or as they call it, lean over fat, this is when you get situations where your painting is more likely to crack in the future is because if a if if an inflexible layer is on top of a more flexible one it doesn't want to move and any movement of the canvas can cause cracking potential um that's the short version of it and if someone wanted to learn more about Fat Overlane the Gambling Colors website does have some more great information about it what I would emphasize is how solvents like Gamsol are your leaner materials, more appropriate for the earlier stages of your painting. Meanwhile, linseed oil or Galkid are your fat, flexible materials that are appropriate for when you get to the middle and upper layers of your artwork. We do have another. Okay. Uh, Gina's asking, um, do you have to mix gels each and every time or is there a tube with oil paints that has the gel mixed in we do not have uh the gel pre-mixed into paint and you can use as much of it or as little of it as you'd like with your colors you are not required to be using the same amount 
throughout. Um, a lot of that stuff is actually personal preference where some artists will pre-mix the same amount of gel into all of their paints for consistency. Other painters might use a little bit of gel with one color, maybe not so much with another, and that's fine. There isn't a right or a wrong way to go about that. Um, some artists, like I mentioned earlier, don't use any gel, don't use any medium, and they just use paint from the tube. Maybe they'll grab a little bit of gel or fluid when they have a stiffer color that they need to be more malleable to work with. Great. Um, Moselle is asking, what about the containers to preserve it with temperature, humid or dry? I'm not sure. Moselle. If they are referring to their palette, their palette of colors. I think it might be with the, um, the Gal Kid. Moselle, oh. can you expand on your question? If you're talking about how to upkeep the shelf life of these mediums, I have a really easy tip for you guys because they can dry out in the bottle. That absolutely can happen. For your gels, you do not need to worry about that. Anything in a tube like your oil colors or your gel mediums, you don't need to worry about them. They're completely enclosed. No oxygen's getting to them. Nothing's going to dry them out. Do keep them away from heat. Don't store them in a hot car or a hot attic because um, that can shorten the shelf life of these products. Keep them at a good room temperature. Now, your fluids, these that come in the bottle, do have the potential to dry out. If you only use half of it and then life happens, you spend six months away from your painting studio or something, it can solidify in the bottle. But I have a really easy tip for you guys to prevent that. All you need to do is store it this way, sitting on its cap rather than on its bottom. When you do that, you create a vapor lock that is going to prevent solvent and air from escaping in and out of the cap itself, which can happen even when you have this secured. So one of the easiest ways to get every drop out of these Galkid products is to store them sitting on their cap rather than up. And we have a note about that on the label here for you guys. Um, for your, your mediums like linseed oil, meanwhile, you do not need to store this upside down um, since it does not contain solvent. It will last a long time before it even starts to dry out. So these have a great shelf life. But do always keep, as, as you would with any of your paints, any of your oil painting products, just keep them away from high heat, as that is what can really shorten their longevity. That was a good question, actually. Very cool trick. Yes. Um, we're next going to talk about cold wax, which is one of the other members of your must-have essentials set. What's interesting about cold wax is it's different from any of the other mediums that we have. And um, talking about the fat over lean aspect, wax is very lean. It is completely uh, free of oil. What it is, is beeswax. We take beeswax and we soak it in Gamsol and then we turn it with blenders into this really soft, malleable paste. I always describe it as a very tactile medium, one that is versatile in that regard. If you enjoy texture, if you like marks, um, this one is fantastic for that. And I'm actually going to use Viridian to show off how thick you can get paint. As a word of precaution on the use of cold wax, you want to be painting on panels. Stretched fabric, canvas, or linen wax is more likely to crack due to its inflexibility. So it is really best utilized on boards, wooden panels, MDF or aluminum panels are another great choice. Um, if you get that covered with a sturdy panel, you can go crazy with the wax. And as you can see here, it makes the paint almost like cake frosting. 
in its thickness. And it just has such a, um, the, the tactile feel of it is like nothing else. One other thing that really sets this medium apart from all the other ones that we have is that it is a matte finish due to the beeswax. It does not produce a glossy finish like all of the other mediums I've shown you do. Your paintings are going to have a very flat, very non-reflective glare to them which does mention another use of wax. Some artists don't enjoy how glossy some mediums are. Like Galkid Light is definitely that way. As I mentioned earlier, solvent-free gel is a fairly glossy medium. So if someone didn't, they like solvent-free gel as an example, but they don't want it to be super glossy, cold wax is there to help you because you don't need very much of it to modify the sheen of your paint. All you would need to do is first squeeze out some of your solvent-free gel and then add a little bit of wax to it. You don't need very much, just a small amount. This might even be going overboard, but you can modify mediums with oils to make them dry slower. You can modify them with Gamsol to make them leaner, more fluid or you can modify them with wax to, to change the sheen at which they dry. So really the possibilities of how you can customize your, your medium, you have a lot of potential. So when this dries, it's not gonna be nearly as glossy as if I was just using the pure gel and nothing else with it. Hey, Mary, I have a couple questions here. Sure. Um, one of the questions is um, if uh, you've been using Galkid and Liquin together, um, can you then go back and use more Galkid or linseed on top? Mm -hmm. Yes, you could. Um, Liquin is another Alkid resin. Liquin, the product from Windsor & Newton, is another Alkid resin medium. So it's perfectly compatible with any of our products. If you, you're ever worried about an incompatibility, um, the Gamblin line is also compatible with most other brands. That includes paint or different mediums. Um, Liquin is very similar to Galkid, actually. They're both alkids that significantly speed up the dry time of paint. I would say that Liquin has a stronger solvent component to it. And you'll notice that how it has more of a, a noticeable smell. It's one of the nice things about Gamsol, which we use in all of our products as the, the solvent component for any of our mediums that contain a solvent. We use Gamsol, which is completely odorless has a majority of the harmful aromatics removed and just really has been a game changer for painters that used to have to work with significantly stronger solvents such as turpentine. Gamsol has really, really been a game changer in that regard. Um, to round back to that particular question, yes, if you'd been using Liquin, Galkid, or a, a combination of Liquin and Galkid, and then later switch to galkid and linseed oil that would be perfectly fine in fact that's a great layering method to follow the fat over lean because when you use linseed oil it has a greater fat to it so you'd be working very well in terms of a flexible painting with that combination of layers great thank you and then also michael is asking can you use cold wax medium on canvas or linen wrapped panels Yes, if the canvas or linen is uh, adhered or stapled or somehow stuck onto a board, that will work perfectly with cold wax. What you don't want to use cold wax with is stretched fabric on stretcher bars. That's where you have more of a cracking potential and you would want to be using uh, boards or a board that has linen or canvas adhered to the front. That was a good clarification, Michael. Thank you for asking that question. Y'all actually have a bunch of great questions and it's nice for me to get a talk as well as we're going along in the product demo. 
Okay. So I want to make sure before we move on to the next segment of the presentation, I wanted to make sure there weren't any other questions on mediums that people have the opportunity to ask those. Um, yeah, there actually was another one. Jeanette is asking if you want a glossy finish, can you varnish a cold wax painting? Oh, good question. And it's funny because varnish is going to be the next segment in our demonstration. So uh, your timing is perfect there. For cold wax paintings, if you use less than one third in mixture with your paint, you can utilize a varnish like Gambar gloss, which we're going to be demonstrating here soon. However, if you use a lot of wax, upwards of a third or more in mixture with your paint, you really shouldn't be using other, other varnishes like, like Gamvar with those. You would instead want to use cold wax itself as your varnish rubbed on very thinly to the painting surface. And in that situation, you're going to need to just um, uh, know that your painting will be more matte looking, more flat. Uh, not as easy to get a glossy or a high gloss finish with cold wax. And it makes sense. It's a beeswax. It has a very flat finish. So it's always lending itself towards flatter, more matte painting. So if you're someone who really likes gloss and it's super important that your paintings be glossy, I would recommend you only use a little bit of wax that way uh, your paintings won't look super matte when they dry and you still have the ability to varnish them with Gamvar afterwards. Great. We've got a few more coming in. So, okay. Uh, Doris is asking, how do you apply cold wax to a completed watercolor painting? Oh, this is a very uh, popular use re uh, recently is the use of cold wax on watercolors. Um, I will issue a disclaimer here. It is an unconventional use for cold wax, but many watercolor artists use it in lieu of framing under glass. What you would get is a very soft rag, um, something like an old t-shirt, something that doesn't have a lot of texture, something that isn't linty. You would take the cold wax, and what I'm gonna emphasize about the use of cold wax as a finish is how you need very, very little on, and I'm going to, just for demonstration purposes, this is not a watercolor painting, but we can pretend in our minds that it is. So if I were varnishing this with cold wax, what I would first do is get just a small amount on a cloth. And when I say small, I really want to emphasize that, how you just pat a really tiny amount of wax on your cloth so there isn't very much on there. Don't be scooping a dollop of it out. That's going to be really difficult to spread. You're just getting a tiny amount on your rag, and then you're going to gently buff it onto the surface of your painting like so in a gentle circular motion. That's really it. There isn't a whole special application technique. It, it's very similar to um, waxing surfaces like you would furniture, cars, boots. Um, if you put it on and leave it on completely to dry, it'll provide a very flat matte finish. But if you continue to buff the wax as it's drying about an hour or so after you apply it, you start to get more of a satin finish in your end result. And you do want to remember for any of the watercolorists out there who want to use cold wax, it is a non-removable finish. Unlike on oil paintings, the wax can be removed if you need to do that. But for watercolor paintings, it is not advisable to try to remove the wax. So once it's on there, it's a permanent part of your watercolor. For this reason, I highly recommend everybody Test it on a sample first, please, before you put it on your most prized watercolor that's going into a juried show. Uh, always test it on a sample first. You'll be doing yourself a favor. That way you can practice the application technique and just know how it's going to turn out in the end. And um, a lot of watercolorists and gouache artists too have been using the cold wax as an alternative for, for glass framing and getting really good results. So 
if any of you out there try it and like it, we'd love to hear from you actually, because um, that that type of alternative use is is one of an interesting things about fold wax as a product. Great. Um, Nan is asking if you are trying to replicate classical, say, Renaissance paintings, you would then recommend panels and cold wax and then fat layer? That would be a very good way to work. You technically do not need to use wax in your early stages unless you liked to. I think that might be nice to build up a little bit of texture, almost like a um, like a, a, a stucco or fresco appearance. But then you always want to be, as you're layering up and adding glazing layers, you want to switch then to your fat products and only have products like Gamsol or cold wax in the early stages when you do your underpainting or in, in prematura style wipe out uh, technique and then layer on top. So yes, that would be a good way to work is using leaner mediums like Gamsol and cold wax in the beginning. And then as you build up with glaze layers and color, switch to your fats like linseed oil or galkid. Great. We have oh, another okay. one. Okay. Um, Ong is asking, he says it may be his last question, <laughs> but no worries. You are fine. You are fine. <laughs> Questions are great. Um, just wondering, can we use Gamblin paint after using what I think he said is liquid white or magic white? Oh, Bob Ross. Mm -hmm. I think, yes. Uh, yeah, wet on wet after the liquid mm -hmm. white can you use the Gamblin. You could, yes. So um, Liquid White is a Bob Ross product. And what it essentially is, is titanium white with uh, linseed oil added to it, is what it is. Or some people uh, could use safflower oil in place for an even longer wet into wet period. And yes, you could. If you've been using Liquid White for your underpainting, you could then switch to uh, any of the Gamblin fat mediums afterwards they would be compatible with that awesome um david is just asking if you'll be talking about restarting paintings about three mm -hmm. or four months later using mediums um you know we can we can cover that in a little bit we are going to talk about repurposing paintings in a little bit and we can touch on that david i'll make sure to remember that when we get to one of the last parts of our demonstration Okay, and then there's one last one for now from Susan. Can you dispose of solvent products down the drain? Is it safe for pipes? No, Susan, yes, that's, that is that is an excellent point to bring up. So solvents like Gamsol should never go down the drain, especially your brush cleaning Gamsol. You don't want to have that go in, into the watershed system. Something really interesting about Gamsol as a solvent if you have something like this for your brush cleaning jar, you'll use it initially, but what happens is all of the pigment is going to settle to the bottom of this jar when you're finished. So the Gamsol clarifies and you can actually reuse it hundreds of times. I'm an oil painter who paints on a weekly basis. It usually takes me two to three years to go through a gallon of Gamsol because of the settling and the recycling process. So all you have to do is wait for the pigment to settle to the bottom and then your Gamsol is ready to be used again. It should not be going down the drain. The pigment that is at the bottom of the jar can also be uh, recycled as well, if you would, and mixed into your own chromatic gray oil paint. If you do wanna uh, pour off the clean Gamsol and take the pigment, mix a little bit of linseed oil back into it, you have a really nice custom gray that is unique to your palette, which is kind of fun too. Um, however, if you don't want to go through that and you do need to get rid of the pigment at the bottom of your jar, you could scoop it out onto either a rag, paper towel, cardboard, um, let that dry, and then it can be disposed of in any ordinary household or studio garbage. For the Gamsol, however, once it does go through many, many settling cycles, it will get, get used up and stop being as effective for brush cleaning. If you need to get rid of 
used Gamsol, you need to take it to your local hazardous waste facility, a recycling center, or drop-off location for solvents. I think they have that a day where you do that once a month here. Yeah. Yeah, the Gamblin factory, we, we definitely have that because we use Gamsol to clean all of our equipment. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. So guys, those are great questions. And to anyone out there, if we don't get to your question or if you think of one later, that happens a lot. You're very welcome to get in touch with us at gamblingcolors.com. We try to be really easy to get a hold of over email. You can set up a phone call. You can even set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with me if you have a particular project something really specialized, or if you just want to ask more questions, if you go over to gamblingcolors.com um, either uh, today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, you can get in touch with us anytime you have a question, even if it was something completely unrelated to what we talked about today. We're always happy to help with those questions. So the next segment of our painting demonstration is going to be varnishing which I know can be an intimidating topic for painters, but we like to, at, at uh, one of our philosophies about varnishing and Gamvar in particular is that it's actually the easiest way to make your painting look better. Um, Gamvar has a really great history to it too. It comes from um, the National Gallery of Art and Robert Gamblin looking for contemporary non-yellowing varnishes in the 80s and 90s. And he was able to identify a stable resin that was used in conservation labs that could be formulated with mild solvents, ones that don't require the use of turpentine, ones that don't require you to wait six months to apply to your painting. Uh, that's one of the best things about Gamvar too, is you can usually apply it within on average two to three weeks after your painting is completed. This painting here has some brush mark texture, but no heavy impasto. After about three weeks, it was ready to varnish. And if you're ever unsure if your painting is ready to varnish, if it has really thick paint and you just don't know, take your thumbnail and gently press it into an area where it has the thickest paint application. If it's firming up or really hard, you're good to go. If it squishes, like it's just formed skin and what's below is still malleable and really squishable, you may want to wait a few more weeks. But the good news is you do not have to wait six months like you do with Damar resin varnishes, mainly because Gamvar isn't made with strong turpentine and is not made with heavy uh, damar, so it can be safely applied and safely removed, even if your painting is relatively fresh. The removability of Gamvar is another great feature to it. It's easy to take off with Gamsol. Removing it will not hurt the painting that's below the varnish. And in the event you decide you want to go with a different finish, you want to maybe do some changes to the painting, um, you can really easily take it off and easily apply it. It's, it's one of the best parts is how easy it is to work with. It's also made with Gamsol, so it's odorless. It comes in a gloss, a satin, and a matte finish for Gamvar, but you can also mix them together to customize the sheen level in your painting. Um, I've found a one-to-one -one mix of the gloss and the satin looks really nice, really nice. But for today's demonstration, we're just gonna be using the classic gloss, which is the original formula. We came out with the satin and the matte in 20. 16. Before that, artists would have to put cold wax into their Gamvar if they wanted to make it less shiny. And then we went ahead and just pre-mixed the wax in there for you. Now, you guys might have noticed, if, in, unless you weren't paying attention, but I put barely any Gamvar into this little cup here. Like I barely put the smallest amount. And that would be something I would stress 
more than anything else about Gamvar gloss or any of the other Gamvar varnishes is that a little goes a long way. A little four ounce bottle, this size has a, a coverage of 80 square feet. So less is more. And please do not pour it directly on the bottom from the bottle onto your artwork. That is probably the easiest way to get too much varnish on your painting. And if you get too much of the gamvar on your painting, it can remain sticky or streaky, and we don't want that. So just pour a very small amount into your cup or into your dish where you, where you can accommodate your brush. The brush itself is also an important factor. Here we're working with the gamvar varnish brush. Uh, it's uh, made in collaboration with our friends at Trakel who have excellent brushes, varnishing, painting, all styles. They helped us develop this brush for the perfect application with all three finishes. It has a synthetic uh, bristle. And what's really noteworthy about this is how it's a very thin, very flat brush. This is not a thick brush. You do not want to be using foam brushes. You do not want to be using mop brushes. If you can't get the Gamvar brush, what I would stress is that it's a very thin, very flat brush without a lot of thickness to it. And applying it really is a breeze. So what I'm going to do here is just barely get the tip of my brush wet. I'm only dipping in maybe the first centimeter or so into the varnish. You're not dunking your brush into a big container of Gamvar. You're just getting the little bit of the tip wet. And then you might even swipe it on the rim of your jar just in case. If you feel like maybe there's too much in there, never hurts to remove the excess. Next, when we apply it to the painting, you can unload it onto your surface first. Try to get it all off of the brush but we're not going to be doing it in a super uniform manner for the whole application. After we unload the brush, we're next going to scrub it and feather it out very vigorously. It's a great sound. Um, for any of you ASMR fans out there, this is your segment. Um, then you continue to scrub it as far as it will go. I know at this point, you're really tempted to re-dip it in your Gamvar, but don't do that yet. You're gonna keep scrubbing and keep feathering. Having good lighting can be very crucial in these situations so that you can tilt your painting and see where there's varnish and where there's no varnish left. So I covered most of this top section with barely any varnish. I'm going to do one more dip in my bowl. And I predict that's going to be more than enough that we need to adequately varnish this painting. So we're going to unload again and then scrub it out. Once you get a handle on varnishing, it actually becomes one of the most satisfying parts of, of the process. And that's why we included it in the must have kit so that you have it at the end as well when you complete your painting. Anyone out there following along, I, I hope maybe someone out there varnishes a painting with me if they had a dry completed painting with them. So as you can see, we've covered the whole thing. You actually wanna pay close attention to the edges this is where it can either not catch or it can pool. So make sure you pay close attention to the edges of the painting so you don't miss any spots. And I'm almost done here. What I can probably do next, just to make sure it's nice and even, I'm gonna blot my brush off really well on a rag. And then I'm just gonna keep feathering it. Now, some of you might be wondering, how do I clean my brush out now? Now that I'm done varnishing, what am I going to do with my nice, beautiful varnishing brush? How do I take good care of it? Well, it's uh, you can clean it with Gamsol. 
You can also clean it with soap and water. I find if you are not overloading the brush, if you're not uh, dunking it, you can actually use soap and water to get a lot of the resin out. Gamsol will also work really effectively at cleaning your brush. You can also do a method where after you're done varnishing and you blot your brush off, you can just lay it flat to dry and not clean it at all in between uses. And let's say a few weeks, maybe a few months down the road, you're going to get ready to varnish your next painting, your next masterpiece, and you go to get your Gamvar brush and you say, oh, well, it's hardened. The, the bristles are stiff now. Did I ruin my brush? You did not. All you would need to do is take your brush and let it sit in a container of Gamsol for five minutes, sometimes less, just a few, a quick dip or a quick so soaking in Gamsol. All of the dry resin that is in your brush is going to immediately come out of it. And it's going to be like, it's brand new right again. So that's what I often do. I will just let the brush dry in between uses, and then I'll reactivate it later with Gamsol when I'm ready to varnish again. And if you have a dedicated varnish brush, that just makes the most sense to do. Great. We do have a few questions if you... Oh, yeah. I figured want. varnishing always brings questions. So, <laughs> yes. Let's go. So, Ong is asking, can we use Gamvar as a retouch varnish? Other company, Windsor & Newton, has retouch varnish. Um, can I use Gamvar varnish more than one time, maybe two times? Well, let's talk about retouching varnishes in general. So Gamvar is not a retouching varnish. I'm really glad that question was asked because it is important. Some artists utilize retouching varnishes in between layers of paint. And it is very important that you do not do that with Gamvar. Gamvar should always be the top layer of your painting and not used as a retouching varnish in between layers of paint. That is the distinction, I believe, between like a Windsor Newton retouching varnish is that it, it's um, not um, the same type of synthetic resin. It is something that can go in between layers and is uh, Gamvar should only be used at the end of your painting. Some artists in the past would utilize retouching varnishes because they were waiting six months to apply their Damar varnish, sometimes they would use a retouch in the short term. But honestly, with Gamvar and how soon you can apply it and that you don't need to wait so long, um, it, it you wouldn't need a retouching varnish in that scenario. Um, and can you explain oiling out? Oiling out is an alternative to retouching. Oiling out, um, this actually ties in very well to the question David asked earlier on how to rework a painting. Uh, oiling out would be a great way to do that. And what you would do is take something like either Galkid, linseed oil, or solvent-free fluid would work. You would dilute it with Gamsol, about a one-to-one -one mixture brush it onto your painting for several minutes, allowing it to soak in. What this does is it rejuvenates the dry old paint layers. It brings up sunken color. It really helps when a painting looks uneven and flat. And the oiling out process after you brush on, let it soak in and then wipe it off, wipe off the excess you can resume painting in that moment. Um, like, like David had asked when you're reworking a piece, you could use the oiling out process to refresh the old painting and then work new on it. Some artists also utilize the oiling out process on a finished painting. If your finished painting already, that's you're planning to varnish, has some uneven color, sunken areas. It's not a bad idea to oil out before you use your Gamvar. What this does is it helps ensure that the Gamvar is gonna dry evenly too, because it reduces the absorbency of your painting. Now, 
sometimes artists will go straight to the gamvar on a really thirsty painting and they don't oil out ahead of time. What can happen is your gamvar may sink in and dry with uneven areas of gloss and matte. And if you do encounter that, you don't need to worry. Simple, simple procedure would be to take the gamvar off with gamsol, oil it out maybe once or twice, wait about a day. Usually it takes maybe a day at the longest for that to dry. And then you re-varnish your painting nine times, nine times out of 10, the varnish then dries really evenly and consistency when you do that step ahead of time. Okay. Um, All right. Jeanette is asking, can you varnish oil pastels? You should not use Gamvar on an oil pastel because the Gamsol will smear it. Unfortunately, oil pastels really are best suited probably for a spray type of varnish, which we, we don't offer that type of varnish at Gam Gamblin. Okay. Um, Tammy is asking, I've heard of using Murphy's oil soap is good to use. I tried it and it works uh, on one of my oil brushes. What about yeah. this varnish you just did? Oh yeah, Murphy's oil soap, that would work too. That would work for all of your oil painting brushes or if you were looking to give your, your varnish brush a really good clean, that would work as well too. Okay, Jean is asking, is a varnish or wax like a lacquer? Uh, lacquer is a different type of word. I believe the main difference is that lacquer is often non-removable and permanent lacquers. What sets a, a pitcher varnish like Gamvar or something like cold wax apart is that it can be taken off of your painting in the future. And that's actually pretty important from a conservation standpoint. You want your painting to have a removable layer in the event as, as the top surface, in the event your painting needs to be cleaned in the future, the cleaning process is much less likely to damage your painting when you have a removable varnish because any dust or dirt has adhered directly to the varnish rather than your painting itself. So um, I think the distinction there, lacquer is often a permanent finishing treatment, whereas these varnishes are, are not permanent. They, they're removable, but that's with there's a purpose for that removability. Um, David is asking, what if you want the dull and shiny parts of your painting to stay that way after varnishing? Oh, th th great. I love this question. In that situation, don't varnish your painting. Simple as that. Some artists do like that aesthetic element where certain areas are flatter. Maybe they want that to recede into the background, whereas they may want other areas like the focal point, the subject matter, a figure. Um, they want that to be glossier and more prominent coming forward. And if that is your intention, you're probably someone who maybe doesn't need to varnish their paintings. And I love to mention that to people, how varnishing is technically optional. If there is something about the varnishing process that inhibits or takes away from your aesthetic intentions, it's a good excuse to forego that process. I have heard, however, of some artists where they will first apply a very thin layer of Gamvar gloss, allow that to dry for 24 hours, and then if you wanted, you could take the cold wax and selectively rub it onto particular areas. Like in this example, I could put it onto the caps of the mushrooms and leave the background glossy. And that is a nice feature of the cold wax is how uh, it can be easily manipulated. You can apply it to just a certain area or all over. Um, it's, it's a fun varnish for, for that reason. It's, that was a great question, David, mainly because I wanted to get across the point how varnishing is technically optional. There are benefits to it, obviously, but it's also something where if you don't want to do it or if it takes away something from your painting process, it's not a required step. Okay. Um, Ong is saying, I used Gamvar for acrylic painting. That's come out great. After varnish on acrylic, I don't think I can work for acrylic again. Uh, after varnish, sometimes I did use oil paint again. 
I think that was okay. Oil painting on acrylic painting. Yes, you can apply oil paints over acrylic. And Gamvar is great for acrylic paintings too. Um, using acrylic underneath oil painting, dry, does it dry faster? The oil paint will not dry significantly faster, but yes, acrylic paints dry much faster than oil. So if you did want to not wait so long for your underpainting to dry, you could opt for acrylics. However, I will arguably say that with our Galkid products at Gamblin, you can really easily have your oil, your underpainting dry within a 24 hour period actually. So if you're using acrylics mainly for their fast dry time, just know that there are options in oil that can do the same for you. Awesome. Okay, great. Were there any other varnish questions from the group? I think we covered it. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. So next, I'm going to pull out that painting that I used earlier. And this time, we're going to show how you can reuse surfaces. This is a pretty nice canvas, and the painting just didn't turn out. Every painting isn't your best masterpiece and you got to learn to know when when one isn't working out for you. And one of my favorite things about our oil ground product is how you can reuse surfaces that way. Any of, any of you out there that aren't already familiar with oil ground, it's essentially a, an oil painter's gesso. Think of it as a primer. Think of it as the foundation of your painting. Many people ask what makes oil ground different than my acrylic gesso. I like my acrylic gesso. Well, one big factor is absorbency. Acrylic gessos are very thirsty and they can really contribute to sinking in desaturated paint, especially if you're the type of painter who works in many thin layers with dark color. An acrylic gesso can really work against you because your paint just becomes dull and flat on drying. One of my favorite things about oil ground is how it is non-absorbent. Colors stay saturated. They stay really vibrant with this by comparison. You can apply oil ground over acrylic gesso, by the way, if you get commercially made canvases or panels that are already primed with acrylic gesso. You can use this over the top of the gesso. And what I'm about to show here is how you can actually use it to cover up a painting. This painting in particular has a lot of texture to it. So we may wanna lightly sand this down ahead of time. Just to roughen it up. Now you don't have to sand, it's not a required step, but if you did want to, in order to get um, rid of any unwanted texture, you don't, you, you can, or you don't have to sand. It's a optional step. And what you'll find with oil ground is that it's a really thick consistency. It is a lot more pigmented and a lot denser than your standard acrylic gesso, which is much more brushable. And one thing you'll notice first is how this stuff is actually too thick to brush on. We're not gonna be brushing it onto our surface for this demonstration. I'm gonna get a little bit out here. Side note, you can also tint the ground with any of your acrylic, not any of acrylic, any of your oil paints, you can tint them with the oil ground. So if you wanted to do a little bit of a, like a burnt umber, an ivory black, you could get a nice like mid-tone gray, or you could use it white as well, um, straight out of the can. Uh, we recently came out uh, just this year with our ground and gesso blade. This is a fun tool just to help with making the priming process easier. You can also use this with an acrylic gesso. If you did prefer acrylic, you could use it with oil ground. I actually like using these two in my painting process to apply glazes of color. So if any of you haven't already checked out 
this ground gesso blade product. It's it's pretty neat. And for this, it's going to help me scrape this ground on. No more rollers, no more using a brush, no more having to clean the brush, just, just this one tool to get everything on there. One of the biggest difference you may also find with oil ground, comparing it to acrylic just so it does not dry as quickly since it is oil-based, it's going to take at least two days, one to two days on average for if you um, are in between coats or before you start painting. You want to do two coats for the best results. In this situation too, you can see how a little bit of my previous painting is still showing through and that's fine. We're just going to, in a day or two after now, we'll apply another layer and then you'll get more even, even coverage then. If any of you out there have never painted on an oil ground and you're more used to acrylic gesso, it can, you know, be a little daunting to make a big switch like that, but you will notice how your paints, your oil colors glide differently. They they just have more flow off of an oil-based primer. And with acrylic paint, one thing I really dislike is how the brush drags across an acrylic surface and you just get a much smoother application of paint on oil-based grounds. And it allows you to reuse surfaces like in this scenario here, after this dries and after I get another layer on this, this is gonna be a perfectly usable painting again. Sometimes you might need to get into all those little nooks and crannies there. And it's really nice how you don't have to feather things out. This blade has a slight taper on the end. So when you apply really light pressure, you can smooth out the grooves and the marks. And my favorite is how easy it is to clean. You just wipe it off and you're good. Uh, similar to how the Galkid, we recommend storing it upside down. We have a similar feature for this oil ground. If you go a long time without using it, you don't want to have a skin on it when you go to use it again. And some of you may have been wondering, why was the label on her ground upside down? And that was actually by intention so that you store it this way with the bottom lid facing down instead of facing up. Our opening is on the bottom there. And that way you don't end up uh, getting a little hockey puck of dried ground on the top of your can when you go to use it again. Um, so Amy and David are both I think, asking the same thing. Um, if painting, if your painting is varnished, do you need to apply um, remove the varnish before priming with the oil? Oh, ground? that's a great question. You technically would you technically would not need to. It would be an optional step. It wouldn't be a bad idea if the painting did have a lot of dust or dirt on it. If it'd been like in a messy or dirty environment, you might just want to wipe it down with Gamsol ahead of time. Just Gamsol. That will partially remove any varnish, but more importantly, it's just going to get any dust or anything that's embedded itself onto the painting. It'll take that off first before you go to put your new primer layer on. Cool. Um, Tammy is asking, once dried and if it is if it still has an uneven surface, do you sand it again? With the oil ground? I believe so. Yeah, you can act, you know, normally you only need to do two layers of oil ground, but if you're finding you want to build up the surface more, you can do multiple coats. And you can sand it as well in between. Sanding is technically an optional step, but if one wanted a really nice smooth surface, you could sand in between applications. Okay. 
Okay. Well, that was most of what we had to show for you guys today, but just know there's a lot more at gamblingcolors.com that you can learn about. We have a lot of articles there. Our tips and techniques page and the experience color page are some of my favorite uh, launching pages where you'll see multiple different articles on all sorts of subjects there. Um, do keep in touch. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Gambling Colors. If you want to see cool videos, get the latest news, you can also subscribe to our email newsletter at the Gambling website or via the link in our Instagram profile. Uh, we're always loving to hear from people. We always like to see what people are doing. If you tag Gambling Colors um, on social media or just send us an email with your paintings, there's only 30 people that work here at Gamblin all the way down from our shipping and packaging department up to um, our president, CEO, Pete Cole, and Robert Gamblin as well. We're a really small company of just 30 individuals. And everyone here, um, in fact, the studio is above the factory floor. And everyone below me is a painter or an artist, a poet, a photographer. The people at Gamblin really care a lot about art. And that's why we put so much into our work. We love to hear from painters. If you want to send us an email, schedule a call. We're always happy to help with questions. We're always open to suggestions or ideas. Um, some fun, fun stuff this year. We got our B Corporation status, which was a huge accomplishment at Gamblin. And what that B Corp means is benefit corporation that Gamblin goes above and beyond to take care of the people at Gamblin. Like just everyone here is, is very well taken care of. We're always striving to uphold that standard and to hold ourselves accountable. And if at any point anyone has feedback or just wants to share what their latest painting was, we want to hear from you guys. So I welcome everybody uh, watching this or here today live. Do check out gamblingcolors.com. And um, if there was something in this demo that you still had a question about, you're really welcome to reach out to us again and yeah. Uh, thanks again to the folks at Plaza for having us back. We always love uh, syncing up with you guys and we'd love to do another one in the future too. Thank you so much, Mary. It was wonderful having you. I know I learned a lot um, that I can actually put to use myself. So um, that was very Beautiful. great. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again from Gamblin. We always love having you with us at Plaza Artist Materials. Thanks everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon on the next one. Have a great rest of your Thank day. You. Thanks Bye. everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Bye. You.